All right, let's take a look at the last part of agriculture here. So this presentation will help you understand feedlot agriculture, aquaculture, and sustainable agriculture. Let's take a look at this graph. We have meat production in red, seafood production in blue, starting in 1960 up until 2005. We can see that they have both increased, and they've actually increased faster than population growth. So there's a greater amount of meat being eaten per person. And this has led to feedlot agriculture. Increased meat consumption has led to animals being raised in feedlots, or called factory farms, huge pens that deliver energy-rich food to animals housed at extremely high densities. And here we can see a cattle feedlot. What are the environmental impacts of this? Well, for one thing, we have an immense amount of waste produced, polluting air and water nearby. Animal waste has a lot of nitrates in it, and so that can actually cause and contribute to eutrophication. It can then, we also see an increase intense usage of chemicals, antibiotics, steroids, and hormones, some of which persists in the environment. And these hormones are given to make the animals grow bigger, to reduce the, uh, to reduce the occurrence of infection. And, um, and these can persist in the environment so that they can get into the water supply, the waterways, the groundwater, etc. However, if all these animals were grazing on rangeland, how much more natural land would be converted for agriculture, and would that be sustainable? So let's take a look at grain feed input, because most of these animals, well, animals in feedlots are not range, they're not free range animals. They are uh, living off of grain that's being provided to them. So you can see here that for a cow, it takes 20 kilograms of feed input in the form of usually corn, to make one kilogram of beef. Whereas for pork, to get one kilogram of pork meat would only take 7.3 kilograms. What is the most efficient one on here? Dairy. 1.1 kilograms of feed input going to the, to the cows to produce one kilogram of milk. And chickens are also pretty efficient here. So we can see that some animal food products can be produced with less input of grain food than others. More input of grain needed means more water and land needed. So our food choices are equivalent to our energy choices or um, contribute to our energy choices. Energy is lost at each trophic level. So if you were eating at the prime, at the secondary trophic level, meaning you are a vegetarian, that is a more efficient energy choice than eating at the, sec at the third trophic level as a consumer, I mean, sorry, as a carnivore. When we eat meat from a cow fed on grain, most of the grain's energy has already been spent on the cow's metabolism, i.e. waste heat. So eating meat is therefore very energy inefficient. We have some other choices though. Um, besides eating um, feedlot raised animals, we can do what's called aquaculture, which is the raising of aquatic organisms for food in controlled environments. It provides one-third of the world's fish for consumption currently, so it's big. 220 species are currently being farmed, and this is the fastest growing type of food production. You can see here how quickly it's risen since, the, since just the mid-80s. It's been doubling about every seven years. And most of it's fish, some, some shellfish like mollusks, some seaweed like aquatic plants here. What are the benefits? There are benefits, and that's one reason why it's grown so much. It provides reliable protein source for people, increases food security. People are less likely to go hungry. It can be done on small scale, local, and sustainable levels. It can reduce fishing pressure on wild stocks and eliminates bycatch, which is unintended catch that happens when we go out and, and, um, and fish in the wild for, for wild fish. It uses fewer fossil fuels in fishing because you're not taking a boat out and it can be very energy efficient. However, there are environmental impacts. Here we see a transgenic salmon on top. That would be a type of salmon that would be farm raised. And it can compete with or spread diseases to wild salmon on the bottom when they escape from fish farms, which is inevitable. So what are some of these other environmental impacts? <clears throat> we already discussed that farmed animals may escape into the wild and interbreed with, compete with, or spread diseases to wild animals. 
but also the density of the animals can lead to disease antibiotic use to help control that disease and risk to food security. It can generate large amounts of waste and this is a waste again that can cause eutrophication. You know, fish produce feces and it has a lot of nitrates that can go into the water, create imbalances. And often these animals are fed grain, which is not very energy efficient. As we already saw, you have to, gr you have to grow the grain in some field in uh, Arkansas and ship it maybe possibly halfway around the country. To, um, to where it's being purchased by a fish farm. And that does require fossil fuels. And sometimes the animals are fed fish meal from wild caught fish. So you're going out, you're catching fish that are not really desirable for eating. You're grinding it up, you're feeding that fish meal to fish in, um, in farms that are, that are of a variety that people do want to eat. For example, salmon. So that doesn't really make sense. And that's pretty energy efficient. So um, let's move, transition to organic farming. So, so far we saw that we are getting food from, um, from feedlot agriculture. We're getting it from aquaculture. There's a process called organic farming, which um, you see a lot of uh, descriptions of what that looks like here. This is taken from our textbook. The USDA has developed criteria to determine whether a given product was grown organically. So what does this mean? Bottom line, you should know this. It means there are no synthetic fertilizers, pesticides, or genetically engineered organisms. And as such, if you really want to try to avoid eating GMOs or GM crops, you should eat organic. And some benefits of this, organic farming through some studies have shown to create deeper topsoil and greater earthworm activity, which are both signs of healthy soil. And so this is from a farm uh, where you had conventional field and then next to it an organic field. And we can see the topsoil depth was always greater. And the earthworm activity also significantly greater for the organic field. So what about organic farming? It is a small percent of the market but right now, right now, but it's growing fast. It's a 1% of the U.S. market, whereas in Europe it's 3 to 5%. The advantages are you can get healthier, environmentally better food. Mostly because you're avoiding the chemical toxins that can be pollutants or toxins for your body. The disadvantages are that it's less, it sometimes creates less uniform and appealing um, uh, produce. In other words, the, um, they might have some spots on them, some more possibly bruising, things like this. Because, um, you know, due to some pesticide or due to some pest activity, a little bit of munching here and there. On the uh, on the fruit, and it can be more expensive. What we um, where this leads oftentimes is locally supported agriculture. There are definitely there's definitely an increase in industrial organic farming, meaning organic farming done on a large scale but using organic methods. Um, but we often see it being used by more local. Um, uh, family farms or just local small business farms. And Cuba is an interesting case because Cuba is a very relatively poor country and so they've been pretty much forced to go organic. Human farmers and citizens went organic out of necessity, lacking the money to invest in synthetic chemicals. However, Cuba's experience shows some successes in controlling pests and increasing yields. They've really been um, have done some pretty awesome things. Here you can even see an urban farm and uh, if that doesn't look like good lettuce, I don't know what does. Alright, so um, let's see, I'd like you to write a short, par short paragraph summary at the end of these notes and I'll see you tomorrow in class.